the Dr. Aya Safi podcast. I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Mohammed Hussein. Dr. Mohammed is a lecturer in the public health and active researcher at Birmingham City University. Dr. Mohammed, research is in public health and social care encompasses a broad spectrum of topics, including but not limited to aging, dementia, mental health, heart failure, and ethnicity, culture, religion, health inequality, and health policy. So in this episode, Dr. Mohammed and I delve into a conversation about dementia, myth, and reality with special focus on ethnic minority groups. Dr. Mohammed, thank you for joining me in today's episode. Thank you, Dr. Safi. I'm very glad to be here. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. I want to start with a basic and broad question of what is dementia and what are some of the common or early signs that people face? Thank you. So uh, actually, before we start talking about dementia, we really uh, need to talk about our brain and we really need to know how it functions. Uh, As you know, the most amazing part of our body is the brain has uh, so many functions. So while while uh, neuroscientists and philosophers have studied the functions of the brain for hundreds of years, there are aspects of our brain power that remain among humanity's, humanity's most enduring and mysterious things. Mm. So understanding how our brain works will help us to understand dementia. So uh, also understanding our uh, how our brain works help us to understand what makes us Uh, unique as humans. So our brain controls everything about us, our personalities, our intelligence, our emotions, our dreams, even our fears. But it's incredibly complex, like nothing else in the whole universe. So if you think of our brain uh, like a super highway, there are over miles, tiny roads inside our brain. And What is another incredible thing, there are around 86 86 billions of nerve cells, also known as neurons, Mm. inside our brain. And what those neurons are doing, they are also, you know, working 24 hours, buzzing like activity. So like if you think about uh, those neurons as our brain's VIP messengers, and what they do, they send messages uh, to each other to keep everything running very smoothly, like every second, every day. For example, when we uh, accidentally hurt hurt the toe or finger of our body, in a blink of an eye, that message goes to our brain. But the problem is when something goes wrong and these nerve cells get damaged, like it's like the road of in our super highway start to break down and this is when dementia can work her. for example but actually so these um, roads are break down like 86 billions 86 billions which are saying neurons break down one of them or two of them or hundreds of them break down at that time dementia take place but actually what is dementia so dementia actually is an umbrella term okay that means Dementia is not a name of one disease. Instead of, it describes a set of symptoms um, that relate to the way our brain functions, as you discussed, so, uh, and how we think. So these symptoms, are, these symptoms, when it happens, it's caused by the damage of those brain cells, the part of the 86 billion neurons. So this loss of neurons has a range of different causes and specific diseases. And that set of symptoms, we call them dementia. So the symptoms, if you ask that the common symptoms of dementia, so that is the thing like it starts with the memory problems. So problems with short term memory, Mm -hmm. uh, concentration and planning, uh, changes in mood, behavior, personality, also confusion about time, confusion about people, places. Uh, so these are the things about also the uh, how we view and understand our world. So everything, you know, when brain works properly, then we understand everything properly because our neurons are working properly. But, but when it gets damaged, one yep. or two neurons, or then it takes place, the dam- actually mm-hmm. dementia in various forms. And uh, if you ask me that uh, the types of dementia, actually, so yep. there are... There are four main types of dementia. Dementia. So we know the people. Uh, we 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 hear about Alzheimer's disease a lot. Yeah, yeah. The reason the reason is Alzheimer's disease uh, because 60 to 80 percent causes of dementia is reason by Alzheimer's disease. 
Okay. And so Alzheimer's disease caused the most dementia, so 60 to 80 percent. And the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, symptoms of Alzheimer's disease dementia is like difficulty finding the right words, disorientation, poor mm -hmm. insight. This is the one thing Alzheimer's disease is the most common. The second common is uh, vascular dementia, okay. which is the most second common cause of dementia, around 15 to 20 percent uh, dementia caused by vascular dementia. And the symptoms like difficulties with uh, planning, organizing, making judgments, these are the things. Uh, so we'll talk about uh, later on maybe the risk factors, but the mostly, yeah, oh, yeah. mostly, mostly these risk factors comes with uh, smoking, diabetes, which we'll, uh, we can touch on later on. Yeah, so, I think, yeah. And the third one is uh, dementia with Lewy bodies, uh, is the okay. another type of dementia that caused by about 10. The reason it causes, there's a, there's a build of proteins in the brain uh, that call Lewy bodies. Uh, and the symptoms are, uh, Similar to Parkinson's disease, uh, they have problems with movement, uh, falls, rigidity, constipation, uh, also uh, visual hallucination, sleep disorder. And the last one is uh, front. It's called frontotemporal dementia. Uh, okay, is another ten to ten percent, or roughly. Mm -hmm. Uh, is caused by loss of brain cells, again, the frontal part and temporal part, lo loss of the brain. And uh, most common symptoms are the changes in personality and behavior. Uh, does that answer all the questions? Oh, yeah, any... I mean, uh, look, thank you so much for, right. for that insight. I think it was such a detailed insight. And because we hear about the dementia here and there and, and the but as you also described the different the common types and, and the percentages of people that, that are impacted by each one um, and which one is the most common, I think yes. that's, that's a very detailed insight. Yes, and, and what happens, sometimes we call a mixed dementia. So, yeah. for example, when Alzheimer's disease vascular, the the more than one dementia, you know, mm -hmm. mixed together, I mean, uh, the symptoms we have, then we call the mixed dementia. So it's very complex, actually, uh, under the umbrella term. So if we take dementia as the umbrella term here for example what would be some of the common challenges that people affected by the dementia would face throughout and also from your research uh, and 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 what are some of the common uh, challenges that the family will go through them because i think from what i have heard or, or when we look at the research dementia is if, if one person in the family is affected by it, that's not the only person that has been impacted. The whole family gets disturbed and, and impact, for example. So what would be some of the common challenges for both the patient and also the families? Absolutely. You're right, Dr. Safi. So yes, it's the challenges when someone has dementia in the family. It's not only the family. Everyone is affected. So as we discussed earlier, that how our brain functions, how our brain, so how it makes us human 100%. When um, as a healthy person, when we are, you know, we have our brain cells all are working perfectly, mm -hmm. our brain cells working perfectly, we, we can understand everything. But if you think about that, the brain cells damage, for example, if if we if someone lost their memory, so the challenges we can feel, you know, so someone uh, told you something or I'm, uh, someone is trying to remember the person's name. Mm -hmm. So the memory loss is the one of the main challenges. It starts from there. So it's it least uh, making it hard to remember recent, even recent events, yes. names, or even familiar, familiar faces. Mm -hmm. And then another problem is, you know, that communication difficulties. So it's dementia progresses. It can become challenging for individuals to express themselves or understand others. So, for example, someone is trying to go some places, get into the bus, asking the driver and couldn't remember, you know, couldn't communicate properly that I want to get, get that stop. Can you drop me? So there's another thing. Um, other thing is daily task. The problem with the daily task. So simple tasks like dressing, eating, bathing, you know, that can be very difficult. Mm -hmm. Behavioral changes. So, you know, the some uh, individuals with dementia experience their mood swings uh, very easily. You know, agitation, aggression, you know, get uh, angry, frustrated. Also the safety concern, uh, because when someone forgets, you know, the confusion, the risk of, you know, accidents and wandering and uh, falls, it, it, yeah. it takes place. But and then now if you talk about the family caregivers, uh, they have a lot of challenges, especially because, as you know, there is no cure for dementia, but it's only the 
they rely on their family members. Um, we'll talk about this later on. So the, the emotional stress, one of the main challenges for uh, family caregivers, you know, watching loved ones. So sometimes, you know, from my research, I understood the daughter saying that my mother couldn't recognize me, that I am a daughter, I am her daughter. So wow. that's the emotional stress. Yeah. yeah. So some of the stress, some of the caregivers were crying during the interview, saying that this was the person, my mother. Mm. I used to go to her when I had a little bit problem with my life, everything. Now I cannot go to her because even she couldn't recognize me. Mm. That's the other thing. Another thing is the time and energy, financial problem with the family caregivers because they couldn't work, they cannot work. Social isolation, they get you know, isolated from the friends, families, and also health issues. There's a, most of the caregivers, they are going through so many uh, health issues because of the, their caregiving burden. So that's the overall general thing. But if you ask me about the ethnic minority, the problem yeah, we'll, with that. We'll ethnic... come to that. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's no, the... no, continue, because that, that was like my, my kind of a next question, for example, because you, you did a PhD on the dementia and impact on ethnic minority, for example. So my next question was like, can you provide an overview of like the, the prevalence and impact of dementia uh, amongst ethnic minorities, in particular with South Asian communities in the UK compared to the general population, for example? And, and also, for example, what would be some of the unique cultural and social barriers that South Asian families, for example, will encounter compared to some other people, for example. And this would include like the support access, for example, and, and, and the community, for example, as a whole, the stigma around it on all of these things. So any overview on that, I think would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. So uh, as you know, the dementia is a, is a growing public health concern uh, and globally. And uh, it has significant uh, social and economic implication for individuals with dementia, uh, dementia families and healthcare system overall. So the number of number of the prevalence, if you talk about prevalence, so now number of people with dementia are currently uh, estimated about 50 million the wow. whole, uh, throughout the world. Wow. Um, however, the global number of people living she is, uh, is steadily increasing. Uh, this figure is likely to increase to 150 million within the next 25 years. So by wow. 20, it's estimated that it could be. Now, if we come back to UK, so there are around 900,000 people with dementia in the UK, wow. uh, which was uh, estimated in 2021, but we are now 20, but it might increase now. So, and every, again, the expenditure, which is around 27 billion per year, wow. which, which doesn't include the caregivers, because most of the caregivers come from family members, and then most of them are unpaid. So around... Mm -hmm around 700,000 dementia caregivers that are unpaid from family members. So we have 900,000 at the moment, uh, which is estimated the next year could be could reach to 1 million. Yeah. And again, uh, it could be uh, 2 million by 20 wow. uh, in the UK. Uh, f but uh, unfortunately for ethnic minority communities in the UK, we do not have exact numbers mm. for how many people with dementia are uh, from the within uh, within the ethnic minority committee, but there was a wall parliamentary group. They estimated that even the Alzheimer Society they estimated that around uh, 25,000 ethnic minority people with dementia are in the UK, okay. which was in which was estimated in 2013, about 10 more than 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. So and they also estimated that it could reach 50,000 by 2026. Okay. And again, from my understanding, from my research, the numbers are very low. There are real numbers are far more than that because these are the numbers, you know, they get estimated. So, uh, so another estimate they made that it could reach um, to 170,000 by 2050. Wow. 2050. So the growth, you can see that they estimated the 600 percent growth in 40 years among yeah. within the ethnic minority groups. So now, uh, if you talk about, think about the unique barriers that face yeah. by ethnic minority, especially South Asian communities, including Bangladeshi, Pakistan, India, so they have uh, several barriers. Uh, the living with dementia compared to general population. Mm -hmm. So one of the things, uh, I mean, one of the that come came from the research that, as you know, that cultural stigma yeah. is uh, often attributed to. 
natural aging, uh, weaknesses, or you know the religious, spiritual curses that within the South Asian culture. So the challenges, you know, when someone has stigmas around dementia, what they do, they you know delay to seek support. Yes. To get the diagnosis. Uh, so another problem, although the first generation, because most of the mm -hmm. people with dementia from ethnic minority are from first generation, the people mm -hmm. who came around 1940, 50. So they are growing at the moment, uh, aging. So mm -hmm. they face difficulties. So those uh, individuals have a little bit language barriers. So yes. I know the children, grandchildren, they are born here. They are studying in this, in this country. They have no problem with English. Mm -hmm. But those people with dementia, they have the language barriers. But we have some of the uh, carers as well. Um, so when you have barriers to the problem with the communication, also another problem is challenges is the our religious, you know, their South Asian because religious beliefs. Yeah. Because our mainstream service providers come from different background, different beliefs. So yeah. and they are not quite aware of those, uh, you know, cultural and religious beliefs. Also, another challenge is biggest challenge. One of the thing is you will be surprised to hear that the, there is no meaning of carer in South Asian dictionary. Mm. So people do not understand what do you mean by carers. The reason yes. they do not understand it doesn't mean that they do not provide care. They are not care. They provide care. So we found that Bangladeshi carer are the most, you know, caregiving, you know, person in this in mm -hmm. this country. They they provide more carers than any other carers. And is that UK. for the family or, or generally to the to the care for home the family? Or, for the so, family, okay. Yes. Yeah. So this is the thing talking about the family dynamic dynamics. So yeah, yeah. the yeah. reason is when they have an elderly person, an ill person, or any you know disabled person in the family, mm -hmm. or people with dementia or mental health, they provide care as a daughter, as a son, as a daughter-in-law. Mm, and that mm. thing is the family responsibility. That thing is, is, I'm a daughter. I have to do it. I'm not a carer. They do not think themselves as a carer. That thing is their religious obligation mm. that they have to provide care as a daughter or as a son or as a daughter-in-law. So that's the problem we have here. Because if we, if we do not recognize ourselves as a carer, yeah. the support we have as a carer outside available, we do not go for this care because we think it's my family responsibilities. So that's the one thing that many carers, they are most of the carers, you know, from these back family, back family members, but they do not recognize them as a carer and they do not go for support because that thing is not the caring job. Yeah. So, so if I take yeah. you back to that religion factor, for example, and as you mentioned, the son, the daughter, the daughter-in-law providing care from the religious point of view, for example, let's take Islam as an example, for example. So in Islam, the and, and this is might be due to the lack of education or understanding about the religion, because in Islam, a daughter-in-law is not obliged to look after the, 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 the in-laws, for example. It's, it's more of a son and the daughter responsibility. But of course, the expectation is there that, well, I think that would be more inclined to the cultural elements. But but you are right, you know, I think, uh, so that family is, you know, the, the, the children of, of that person or the family is looking after them. What do you think, you know, on, on that basis, would it be better if somebody who is affected by dementia is looked after their own son or daughters, for example, sons or daughters, rather than an external carer for example who is a stranger to them yes that person might be trained and qualified and so, or so on but which one do you think if there is any preferences what what would people prefer more because yes. islamically for example yes we have a duty to, towards our parents and our parents has duty towards us and so on so when it comes to for example my personal preference would be if god forbid something happens to my parents at that age i would prefer to I used to get the qualified doctors and, and nurses and, and to, to kind of be there. But also, I would rather look after them myself rather than bringing a stranger to kind of bait them or, or change their clothes or feed them because that person is doing it for the money and I'm doing it because of the love and, and the depth that I need to repay back to my parents, for example. So that's, again, the cultural and the religious elements will come into there. But what do you think if, if like, what would people prefer more? So, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you for reminding my reminding me about my PhD. So this is the one of the, you know, uh, component from my PhD I found mm. 
I talk about Islamic perspective uh, in a little bit, but before that, the cultural perspective. So, for example, yeah. before my research, the previous research um, conducted, there are caring agencies out mm-hmm. there. You know, when they they provide, they come to houses when they need someone to provide carers. Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, f- provide care for the people with dementia. So they call them and they send carers for uh, about. It depends how you know, how they can afford it. So sometimes they call for 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the afternoon, sometimes for half an hour. And the cultural barriers here is they send uh, different languages and the people, for example, one patient with Gujarati background. Yeah. And this person came from uh, uh, Urdu background. Okay. And they said, no, I need someone who is, who speaks Gujarati. Mm -hmm. And then the second preference, they said, oh, I need someone who will be my same religious background. Okay. You know, so as you mentioned, the word stranger, they do not mm-hmm. welcome stranger coming to house. They said the people talk in the community, oh, when the carer will be in the house, we have family matters, we discuss in our own language, you know, mm-hmm. that people, so the other person will hear us so that it can spread outside our family. So that's the one cultural barriers. But the Islamic perspective, what he found in a very, you know, interesting, that thing, uh, the preference, who will provide the care? Mm. So the Islamic way, they said, if as a son, if my mother suffering from dementia, they said it's forbidden for my, for as a son, as a male members of the family, providing care for the opposite family members, for daughters. So we need, it needs to be uh, female to female. If my wife looking after my father, so father-in-law, you know, it can be, can be possible. It's not, you know, it's not allowed in the, in the talk about this. So there need to be a daughter to her mother, okay. not the father. So even within the family, there is some restriction religiously mm-hmm. because the f- female shouldn't look after the male, uh, you know, apart from the fa- husband, but not the f- husband's father. So that's yeah. the one problem we have. Mm-hmm. And this is the internally within the family. We cannot opposite sex carrying problem. Mm. And when you talk about external, there is no way that we can any opposite sex member, opposite sex carers coming to provide care, the male coming to female, female coming to male. So that's the thing, the problem. So progress, as you said, you know, the qualified nurses, that's the thing. That's the thing. They want services. So they actually, pro, uh, you know, prefer, you know, prefer more gender, gender-based caring, mm, religiously yeah. based mm. than the qualified. But it might, it's changing, you know, our attitude, the attitude is based on the research and uh, other, you know, the work going on, you know, raising awareness. So it's changing, but the, still there is a problem with the opposite sex carrying problem. And I, I, I don't think it's only for the ethnic minority of South Asian, it's for other, you know, the preference sometimes so. goes to, yeah. yeah. Because, you know, you don't, the most of the thing is, you know, when, the, when they want the carers, when it yeah. goes to the later stages of dementia, mm. dementia, when, you know, incontinence, you know, the you know, need to change the clothing, you know, cleaning the person with dementia. Yeah, yeah. And when you need to clean it, you need to, you know, um, change the, you know, clothing, dressing it, bathing it. And they actually really want someone is the same sex carer. Yeah. Yeah. I th- so on that basis, for example, the this to stay a little bit on still around the stigma for example, because we talked about the culture and the religious aspects. So how does, do you think, the stigma surrounding the dementia and the mental health issues as general, for example, in particular within, again, the ethnic minority communities, could potentially affect the diagnosis, the treatment, and the care of the individual with the dementia? Because if we want, for example, somebody from the same gender same ethnic group, same religion, and sometimes that is difficult to accommodate, especially if you are going outside of the family, for example. Even getting a GP appointment nowadays, um, a male to a male, for example, is a difficult, or, or, or female to a female, it's, it's a difficult. So because of the demands and, 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 and the workload and so on. So how do you think that stigma surrounding all of these issues that we have discussed so far could potentially impact the diagnosis, the treatment, and the care for that particular person. 
So uh, the stigma actually significantly impact uh, the diagnosis, treatment, or care for individuals in the South Asian communities. So um, before we start on this, I just want to make a little bit clear about sure. the, uh, you know, when you mentioned about the uh, finding a same-sex GP, mm. it's not actually very, you know, it's, it's not about the GP. The, uh, it, I mentioned that uh, when they really need to, you know, that um, dealing with the incontinence, you know, mm. when, you know, the need is changing. So that time actually is really, they want someone the same sex care. But for GP, uh, it's okay. Sometimes you're saying this. No, yeah. just an example. For example. example yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So this, I just want to. So yeah. the stigma, which you're talking about, the, mm -hmm. the, one of the things is, uh, again, when you talk about stigma, before I started my PhD in 2012, the stigma, mm -hmm. a lot of stigmas, all the studies in talking about stigma, stigma. But it recently, I mean, the, the current studies, they're, the stigma, the people, you know, because there's so many, you know, research going on and people became more aware than before. Mm. So the at the current time, you know, the stigma is still there, but it's not like, you know, like before. So the stigma, the impact have, you know, delayed diagnosis because uh, nobody wants to share this. Uh, mm. So, for example, most of the South Asian communities, uh, uh, family members, they, you know, try to live with an extended family members that stick together. And uh, so when there is stigma, they don't want to share with other family members. Yeah. So if they, even, you know, when they do not want to share this with other family members, and uh, in going to the services is the far away thing, you know, because if we, you know, so, and again, misconception about dementia, the, the, the stigma comes from the misconception because the thing, uh, first of all, is a very normal one that is part of normal aging. Mm. Secondly, that thing uh, is that um, stigma comes from that, um, the reason this person is suffering from dementia, uh, definitely this person did some kind of sins in the pre yeah. in the when, yeah, when yeah, they're here. That. Yes, yes. So the, yeah. the, it's the curse, it's the punishment from Allah, mm -hmm. God. Yeah, mm -hmm. so the resulting in reader. And uh, also the leveling, the fear of level, there's a putting that, oh, this person. So the thing is, uh, the reason is uh, the stigma comes from because the thing, dementia, they compare with madness. So in South Asian culture, if you think okay. about the, yeah. you know, India, the mental health, and dementia and other things, everything go under broad umbrella, which you call madness. Yes. You know, that we need to, we need to um, put this person in a, in a barrier, in a case or in a, she called them, um, you know, tie them in a, yeah, yeah. because uh, the, up, mental, yeah. the madness, it happens. Um, so the thing, dementia is uh, equal to madness. So some people think, oh, this person has gone mad hmm. or, or sometime um, it, it happens, even if it came from the research, you know, in the Quran, it mentioned that uh, Allah created, God created a human and jinn. Yes. So there are jinn, uh, bad jinn, uh, bad spirits. They, yep. you know, influence that person. Yeah. So the bad jinn impacted that person, mental illness. So those are the things. So, you know, the thing, oh, if you are a pious, religious person, that bad jinn would not come to you. So that's mm. the stigma and other thing. And so the treatment, uh, cultural beliefs or practices, you know, conflict with the prescribed treatments as you mentioned that uh, uh, that stigma impact on the social isolation is not only for the people with dementia and uh, people with uh, care, dementia carers as well and there are research conducted in it happened how stigma was severe was yeah. this when the visitors came they hide uh, they hid the, the people with dementia under the basement Wow. That that took the it was in the research in 2007 in in Bradford it research conducted. So what happened uh, when the visitors came? They took the person with dementia in the basement. The reason, because uh, you know people with dementia when he was talking he didn't make any sense saying uh -huh. one thing other thing you know sometimes you know changing clothes you know open even so many things that's why in order to protect them from being being uh, embarrassed or anything they they hit yeah. the person. So instead of, instead of uh, you know, disclosing the problem, they hit the person. So addressing stigma, actually, suddenly dementia is within South Asian community is require, you know, a very sensitive approach that yeah. could, you know, by promoting awareness, education, acceptance, acceptance cool, of yes. dementia. Yeah. Yeah. You know, okay. going back a little bit, you mentioned about the jinn, the demons, for example, and, and the madness that that's been regarded uh, within certain communities. I remember something a bit from my personal side. When I was doing my PhD, 
and going through that process, I was affected with uh, anxiety and depression. So there were kind of times where I would just pass out. I would get a panic, for example, and I would get palpitation. So all of the uh, related uh, symptoms uh, was there, and I was very restless as well. Um, so I, I did go to the doctors and sought medical attention. So medically, I was sound. I was perfectly fine. I did my heart trace, my EEG, ECG, uh, every single test that you can imagine that has been done. Because as a young, exercising, active, eating healthy, researching with, within the public health and sports science domain and about exercise, health and well-being, so I was referred to the healthy minds, for example, and, and the to look into the anxiety and depression aspect. And they kind of diagnosed me with the extremely high level of it. My family was very, very accommodating, uh, very supportive. But outside of the home, I wouldn't go as much. I would avoid going because I would get a panic attack. And there were occasions where it, it took place and in the workplace and whilst I was doing my research and also while I was socializing with my friends. And the feedback that I've received or, or the comment that I was received, oh, Safi's gone crazy. Like, what's wrong with him? He's a strong man. You know, why can't he control his mind, for example? And then later, so the, the, this, these are some of the comments which aligns with what you just outlined there and as some of my personal journey that I went through. So later, you know, after doing everything medically, I've kind of begun to investigate the demon, the black magic, and, and so on through the Islamic uh, perspective, like, okay, what's happening, why people are doing it, or, or what happens when you are affected by it. And I think it's, it's, it was to my surprise that throughout the two and a half years of the journey of me speaking to different scholars, different go to different mosques, and so on, and how many scholars I have actually discovered to be the black magicians themselves, to deal with the jinns and the demons and stuff. It was like, that journey was, you know, it, obviously as I was going through it, it was hell. But as I started to discovering the actual scholars are doing these nasty things on people, I was surprised. You know, I, I, I know like, for example, so many local masks and so many imams or the scholars that, that are actually involved in doing black magic and then saying oh this is nothing it's a natural healing for example or, or i am a natural healer for example they would consider themselves but they would actually do the magic and then this, this is where the stigma aspect comes back because then you can't really go and sit with everybody and say look as a man especially it's even hard for example that to say look i have anxiety or i have a depression or i'm impacted by this so i have gone through that journey and, and i've we will discuss this in a mode. I can totally relate to it. But then when I, I'm still kind of obviously going through the phases of the different um, yes. that, that journey, but because I don't think you can ever recover back fully. But since then, I've started talking about it. Like mm. I'm talking about it right now, for example, and people can, can hear and watch this. And since I'm talking about it, I think I've, especially with other young men and, and all, in particular with the man saying, look, if you have these symptoms, you need to talk about it. Don't just yes. suffer in silence. Because yes. I didn't suffer in silence. My family was there, like my brothers uh, um, and my, my nieces, nephews, my sister-in-law uh, at the time, and, and my other sisters and, and external families. They, they were all supportive. Like every time something happens, they yes, were supportive. Yes, support, support yeah. is important. And, and that was so important at that time to me, like mm. so important. Yes. But yeah, yeah, so totally, I think stigma surrounding, like considering people, considering that the, com the community people can consider you as a mad or as a, oh, he's a mentally ill, for example. Mm. Can, can you just kind of be a bit more accommodating and supportive to a person who is going through yes, certain journey? Yes, I think that's, that's a very important point. So thank you for raising that. So you this know? is the thing. Yeah, you mentioned a demon and uh, these things, uh, anxiety was not recognized. Um, yeah. It's still not, but as a, you know, the more research going on, more awareness. So uh, the community, at the community level as well. So the imams and uh, there, there are so many you know, uh, brilliant, uh, you know, educated imams nowadays, yeah. they give a lot of information. So uh, these demands are actually even, 
the lack of knowledge. So in Islam, we say that it's our, you know, their master to look after their parents. But yeah. when the dementia took place, you know, they started to, the son started to hate the mother mm. because it said it's the demon demon and yes, they said it's, yeah. it's a great great scene that mother did so it's it, it's in the re, in the research yeah it's in the oh, research yes yes, yes I can, it's in the yeah, research yeah, yeah. Uh, as i mentioned it's in the research uh, mother helped her daughter when she was okay her, her daughter fell in love with a white man yeah english man mm-hmm. uh, non-muslim yeah and the brother brother you know the mother's son yeah yeah, know, yeah yeah brother was not you know even brother didn't know about this mm-hmm. so the daughter uh, mother helped her to run, run, you know run away from the home with that man okay so that's the story happened and then you know the you know the she left from the home you know the and after a few years the mother suffered from dementia I see. and the and the family members started to believe that because mother let that happen, you know, help that happen to happen, allowed that. Yes. That's the reason mother is. So the son started to hate mother. Mm. So then who, the mother, son was not looking after the mother. It was the granddaughter. The granddaughter was looking after. So it, it wow. came out in the research. That, I mean, there is. And, and I, I, again, going back to my uh, journey, for example, through the anxiety, depression, or maybe black magic, as some uh, scholars um, considered it, I've I've discovered I've looked into maybe thousands of thousands of published journal articles and maybe read like more than twenty thirty books around it. For example, one of the 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 scholar uh, Dr. Bilal Phillips, uh, who did a PhD in demon and black magic, and and he went across to the different countries: um, Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, Saudi, I think. And so on, and, and discover like what's happening, why are people doing magic, and also who are impacted mostly by it. And in his book, he outlines that the consumer of the black magic, for example, or the people who actually goes to the magicians are females. Majority of the the, the consumer or the customers are females, and they're the one who been then impacted by it. And then there's lots of myths and reality surrounding that area but that's uh, again i think it's it's good that you mentioned that here because um it's it's a very interconnected area but it, i think then the black magic itself is 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 an area where then it needs a discussion with with mm. the specialist from that yes. side um but yeah so um thank you for that and coming back to the dementia aspect for example from your research and also generally like is there any potential connection of dementia with other health conditions that may be prevalent in certain ethnic communities? For example, such as diabetes, cardi- other cardiovascular diseases, and how these different comorbid- uh, the, the d- different diseases can impact then the management and care of dementia patients. For example, we know by by research that um, ethnic minority in the UK and across the Europe has the worst health and among the ethnic minority of the different people then Bangladeshi people has one of the worst health conditions um, some of the contributing factor to that could be their sedentary lifestyle the the nutrition intake uh, being not being physically active for example so if what's a connection with a yeah. of the dementia and other health condition, for example. Yes, th- thank you. Thank you. That's a very important question. So, yes, there are strong connections. And so mm-hmm. research uh, found that evidence shows that uh, there are seven risk factors, mm-hmm. uh, seven connections with dementia. Okay. So, including, as you mentioned, uh, midlife obesity, physical in- inactivity, mm-hmm. uh, your research, physical activity, inactivity within the community, smoking, mm-hmm. low mm-hmm. education, diabetes, Melissa, and midlife hypertension, also depression. So mm-hmm. there are seven major risk factors, seven major connection with the dementia. Uh, so comorbidity, um, uh, comorbidities such as diabetes and cardiovascular disease can have significant impacts on the care and management of dementia mm-hmm. in several ways. For example, we can imagine when someone suffer from more than one illnesses, diabetes plus uh, 
dementia plus heart disease. So these are the things. Then we have, uh, you know, complex treatment plans. Mm. So we have to take so many medicines. Medicine. So managing managing multiple conditions uh, simultaneously can uh, complicate treatment plans for individuals with the dementia. Also, you know, healthcare providers, you know, they have to consider potential interaction between this medication in treat this dementia. Mm-hmm. And for especially for people with dementia, when they have other conditions, you know, they have to be use more healthcare mm-hmm. than others. So individuals with dementia, uh, they require more frequent healthcare visits, hospitalization, yeah, specialist consultation. It also related to cognitive decline. So diabetes and cardiovascular disease uh, you know, it severely impacts the cognitive decline in individuals yeah. with dementia, chronic condition, uh, for example, um, you know, uh, hypertension lead to reduce blood pressure, blood flow to the mm. brain. And then uh, also the functional decline, you know, yeah. the presence of community, they, they cannot function properly, uh, making it challenging for individuals. Uh, that significantly, you know, impact on caregivers. So okay. caregiver burden, you mm-hmm. know, managing the care needs of individual with multiple conditions, uh, they have a significant burden on the carers. And also, you know, the treatment adherence. So, you know, sticking to the treatment, it's difficult. Yeah. So mm-hmm. you should do something for diabetes, do something for dementia, do something for the. So it can be, you know, you know, adhere to this treatment plan is difficulty. And uh, they also need palliative care needs because mm-hmm. when people have so many, you know, they can be emotionally, you know, drained. Uh, they can have so many pains, you know, so much pain. Uh, and the overall quality of life, you know, can decline. So palliative care services should be mm. integrated. But if you uh, think about this connection, these uh, seven risk factors for ethnic minority, as you mentioned, mm-hmm. the diabetes. So you're yeah. absolutely right, you know. Uh, so, uh, for example, research shows that higher rates of obesity among South Asian and Black Caribbean. Yeah. Physical inactivity is the one of the measure, you know, they have uh, very low levels of physical activity yeah. among uh, South Asian Muslim community. Yeah. And if you think about the general, you know, gender, the women, yes. they are mostly affected. Yes, yes. And the smoking is the another connection with the diabetes, uh, dementia is the another risk factor. Mm-hmm. And the research shows that, you know, Bangladesh and Pakistani in the UK, they have most highest rates of smoking. Wow. Low education also, if you think about South Asian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi community, they have low education. Yes. Diabetes is the highest rates of diabetes among with the ethnic minority. Uh, hypertension, depression. So these are the things. Now, when you see these kind of uh, seven risk factors yep. are higher, highest in the ethnic minority. So the, it's definitely the numbers. will. That's why... Earlier, we mentioned that 600% increase will be oh, yes. dementia among the ethnic minority communities mm-hmm. because of these risk factors. I, again, that totally can relate to that. One of our recent paper uh, that was published, um, we looked into the, well, we evaluated the physical activity levels of um, different ethnic minority groups. And this was the first paper that, looked, that included ethnic minority from Afghanistan. For example, the Afghan communities in the UK, compared to um, Bangladeshis, Pakistanis, and Indians heritages. So, and and again, the, the, our findings showed that Bangladeshi adolescents, the young people that we focus on at the age of 15, 16, which are very hard to get uh, at that age. So, we found our findings showed that this particular group, people from Bangladeshi, were the least active out of all of them, followed by the Afghan community. And then we found that the Indian adolescents were the most active compared Mm. to all of the others. Mm. And what we did find also is overall, we found that females uh, were the least active uh, compared to the males or boys. And this again applies to across the spectrum if you look at the literature in physical activity health or well-being even the retention rate in any interventions for example that health or well-being or physical activity type of intervention that's been delivered the the participant rate of females are higher but Mm -hmm. then the dropout rate 
is also higher in the female mm. um, kind of uh, domain. So, so yeah. So I mean, that's uh, again, physical activity is something that, uh, from the research, I, I think you will agree that could potentially play a role in contributing positively to the dementia, to the cardiovascular diseases, uh, hypertension, diabetes, all of others. So, no, thank you for that. And and coming back because we talked about the the family and the impact on the if you can recall i outlined the family support that i received throughout my journey for example but what role do you do you think the family could play in terms of providing the care to the individuals with dementia and also what support services are available to assess them for example if somebody in my house uh, is affected with dementia God forbid, what support could I provide? And also, what support could I have access to say, okay, I have a family family member affected. So where do I kind of access the support to then provide that support? And how do you think this is applicable to, given that, that we discussed the ethnic minority community and the lack of education and the awareness and the culture, the religion aspect, but then again, bringing it back to the ethnic minority, how do you think is this, could be applicable to the minority communities. Yes. Thank you, thank you. So yes, family members actually play an essential role in supporting individuals with uh, uh, people with living, living with dementia. So if there are no family members looking after the dementia, there will be biggest problem. So mm. at the moment, as you mentioned, it might be more, but 700,000 uh, yeah. family carers living uh, looking after people with dementia because um, uh, they are working 24 hours a day. And they have significant, uh, you know, impact on the quality and well-being, quality of life and the well-being mm-hmm. of person with dementia. So uh, the the role they play with, like, as you said, you know, assistance with the activities of daily living. So daily living uh, assistance, uh, every day, like bathing, dressing, yeah. eating, on toileting. This ensures the individual safety and well-being. Emotional support. Uh, one of the things is uh, emotionally they break down. Yeah. yeah, family members. And so the love, support, you know, they need, which can help person with dementia feel secure and connected. Mm-hmm. Also, uh, the monitoring and the management of their, you know, uh, condition, yeah. uh, identifying changes in changing in symptoms because their uh, symptoms fluctuate. Yeah. Uh, their symptoms fluctuate, you know, behavior uh, fluctuates on you know, a day-to-day basis. So someone feel, you know, okay, in the morning, in the evening, they fluctuate. So they, they're, they're, someone needs to monitor them, how they are doing. Also, another part is for the family care is the advocacy and the decision-making. So uh-huh. when the health providers, health, you know, health professionals contact them, it's the carers who make the decision, most of the decision for them, because they cannot make decision. people with dementia. So the, the navigation, you know, so this is the, one of the things, you know, whether it's appointment, medication, uh, these are the things, ensuring the person receives the best possible care. But the challenges for, again, challenges for family members, uh, care, as we mentioned, that they have become, you know, overburdened, emotionally overburdened, you know, social isolation, lack of support, the other things. Sometimes they feel, they feel overwhelmed. And yeah. the lack of access to adequate services, yeah, yeah. support services and resources. But where you, where can you know you can go for support? Uh, but if you think about ethnic minority people, sometimes most of the time they rely on the family members to the, get the support. For example, the people with dementia may have six or five children, so they want that in turn each family member can you know look after the person with yeah. dementia. Mm-hmm. But again. It's become, uh, you know, very difficult in this country because everyone is work, you know, life is yeah, very yeah. busy, work yeah. oriented. So what they do, um, they do, you know, by themselves without, you know, leaving their jobs or anything. Yeah. Uh, but support, I believe you ask, you know, where you can get support. So first of all, you know, Alzheimer's Society is the, yeah. you know, dedicated service. You know, they have services throughout the country. Mm-hmm. Also, the local council, they can, you know, also the first point, uh, GP, yeah. they can they can signpost where to get support, where to get. So the problem, you know, if anything happens or if any suspicion within the family that that, that person, you know, 
behavior symptom, you know, something like it doesn't feel good, you know, it doesn't feel that, you know, doing, going okay. So the first point of contact would be with the GP, talking to the GP. Mm-hmm. Then GP will give, you know, provide good advice then where you can get support. And then. another thing is, you know, there are numbers available, Alzheimer's Society. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's a, a, you can call anyone because dementia. You can. So there are so many other, you know, charity organization out there to receive support. Uh, actually, you uh, know, based on uh, that um, organization that is providing the support, for example, that's Alzamera or GP or the local council or any other um, organization that's providing dementia uh, su- support. What do you think? could be the specific challenges uh, or consideration when it comes to, for example, providing culturally appropriate and sensitive dementia care services, especially for the ethnic minority groups in the UK, given that we discussed the challenges, we discussed the cultural aspect, the stigma surrounding the religion, the gender issue, and so on. But these organizations, maybe ethnic minority groups in particular, for example, so what, what advice do you think you would give to these organizations and also what kind of support they can provide to tailor it to the ethnic minority groups so the accessibility from those services can then improve so that people benefit from it. So the service providers, actually the challenges most of the time that they used to face uh, hmm. previously, I mean, even till now, the, the language and communication, yeah. language various uh, effective communication, and sometimes even the language there is no language barriers, but the cultural beliefs and mm-hmm. the values. Because uh, maybe they are speaking okay with the language, we're doing okay with the language, but sometimes they do not understand the cultural, you know, the religious barriers. And to be honest, we cannot expect from the service providers, they will be really very aware of the cultural and religious mm. things. So providing care, for example, as you found in the research that uh, they want same-sex care. Yeah. They, but for my you know, research, it, it was very you know, challenging. So it, there are many occasions it happened. It's not only for, for Bangladeshi community, other community members as well. The uh, caring agency sent carers to home. Yeah. And they knock the door and open the door and they, they didn't like the carers. They send them back, send them back. Even the person is needed very, you know, um, uh, emergency service they needed actually. Wow. Okay. But when they didn't, they didn't see it's not from the, you know, aligned with their religious, cultural mm. background or language and they send them back. So it happened. So cultural, so they need to understand the cultural val- beliefs and values and uh, um, again, we have the problem with the, you know, finding the right carers for right, yeah. the right person. Mm-hmm. And uh, another thing they can do, you know, uh, the talk through about the stigma and misconception about the surrounding, the involvement with the wider community members, yes. community yeah. led leaders, mm-hmm. family members, and especially the faith leaders, the religious yeah. faith leaders. So if the service providers, they contact the imams at the mosque. Yeah. Because imams are the most respected and the most communicable, you know, community leaders, faith leaders yeah, yeah. In the, within the community. Yeah. So they can communicate with the local community people. Other thing is very properly than other, 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 you know, service providers. Yeah. So if they can contact them. So the imams, they can talk about the, the religion and spiritual aspect as well. Um, that Because we cannot provide a service without putting religious beliefs into the into in the place uh, we cannot exclude them we need to include them yeah and other thing is uh the most of the thing uh, sending uh, people with dementia to care homes hmm. so, so most of the findings you know come from came from my research that the one of the problem came from there's a cleanliness and the dietary the food the one thing that the two things they mentioned they don't the reason they don't want to put you send them in care homes uh, because uh, they, they don't like the cleanliness. Mm. And second thing is there there are no halal foods in the... Okay. So these are the things that the service providers, they need to take into consideration when you know they need to look after the people. So I know we have very good facilities in the hospital. They have they provide yeah. halal foods. In the, but the thing is cleanliness, because cleanliness is another uh, you know important part of faith. 
yes, in Islam. Yes, it is actually. Yes. In the, yeah. So what they want, they do not want, you know, wipe, you know, only with the tissues or, yeah, yeah. you know, they want to use water. Yeah. So they need to, and it's very difficult for the service providers providing these yeah. services. So in this case, you know, they have to, you know, bring those resources in place, you know, which is culturally tailored, religiously tailored intervention. They have to do it. Absolutely. And I th- yes. And, and I think, you know, you talked about the involvement of the local mosques, for example. I think that's that's a significant factor because, for example, Friday when, when people come together for the Friday prayers, and this is something that I, in the past, I did discuss with some of the local uh, imams, the scholars. And when I went there for the one week, two weeks, three weeks, the, the khutbah, they call it the sermon, for example, it was as such that there was no proper home take message. That, you know, I wanted to hear something from the scholar to come home and convey that to my family to say, you know what, this is what we actually spoke in a, in a mass today, or this is what the imam was saying. So I actually then went and spoke to the different imams uh, in the local communities and said, why don't you, instead of talking about something that the relevance might not be so much to the contemporary issues that we are facing now in our communities or the challenges that we are facing, why don't you instead then talk about, for example, the crime in the community, the diabetes, like the other health conditions, for example. So you give someone the, the people, like 200, 300,000 people, depending on the capacity of the mosque, for example, comes together. Why don't you give them like five or six home take messages that they can go and, and talk to them about the, to, to their families? And, and I think the example, one of the examples that actually then led us to do that study, the, the one that we are currently working on, the, the physical activity and health from the Islamic perspective. Um, so... We then went and spoke to the imams, for example, and then actually some of the imams implemented the idea. They spoke about some of the challenges and so on. And also inviting these um, organizations or this orga- these organizations reaching out to these communities, these mosques, and saying, if we can come on Friday for five to ten minutes and talk to the people here to say, okay, what is dementia? For example, like at the start of this uh, episode, I've posed a question like, what is it? You know, how can people understand what is dementia? What are the symptoms? And so they tell that people, and I think that educational level, the awareness can have a significant positive impact. And also, again, it's, it's like they tailor it because Islamically speaking, in, in, in the mosque as well as in the other places, the, the, the male and the female are separated or sitting separately, for example. So again, bringing, and also, what do you think? Because if these organizations are providing these services, and of course, again, they can't do everything possible, but taking that culture, that religion aspect into consideration, do you think would he be ideal or what would be your message to the youth from the ethnic minority communities, for example, uh, the ones that are going to universities now or are going to colleges and stuff? What do you think they could kind of choose certain subjects and then give back to the community, for example. Again, study health and social care, for example, or or maybe nursing, for example, and so on. Because if we look at the nursing data, we have some great uh, amount of nurses from the ethnic minority groups, but then they don't go and work in hospitals or in the communities. They sit at home. They get married, for example, and they move on with their life. They become a full-time housewife. So. If we have more and more people, qualified people, whether that's nurses or, or whether that is doctors, for example, or community champions where they can go and increase the awareness about the different issues, health conditions and so on, do you think that would be something that may help overcome the stigma and, and the negativity around the culture side of towards Yes, dementia? you're right. Absolutely right. So, yeah, for youth, uh, young generation, they could go for, um, you know, public health or health service, health and social care courses. But in order to understand mental health and other issues in dementia, they actually do not need to go for these uh, courses, especially. So they are uh, like Alzheimer's Society or Dementia UK. They are running some, you know, awareness courses. And okay. so when they sign up, uh, after a few uh, few awareness courses, they give badge like I'm I'm a dementia champion. 
Okay. So okay. it it it's it's uh, yeah, this championship is all over the world. Hmm. I've seen even in Bangladesh the people uh, the dementia Alzheimer's society going to the offices. They're giving them some kind of leaflet, reading them. Once they're reading them, and they put a badge that I'm a dementia champion. Ask me anything about dementia, I can tell you. Hmm. So this kind of awareness actually they are running. And it will be really helpful. So I think and it's going, it's growing as well. It's growing. That's why we have a, you know, lack of a misconception, lack of a stigma right now in the UK and other, other parts of the world, uh, like we had before 10, 12 years ago. You yeah, know. No, de- de- definitely, I think. And, and that, that's a very good point, what you mentioned about the championing and, and the awareness courses. You completed, I mentioned earlier, your PhD, focus on ethnic minorities, especially South Asian from Bangladeshi background. And also some of your current research is in, in uh, focusing on the dementia and the health aspect and so on. Based on your research, what do you think are the top two or three um, common myths and realities about dementia, especially related to the South Asian? I think you mentioned some earlier people consider yes. people mad and so on any yeah. any other common myth and realities yes so uh, i haven't actually uh, found uh, i didn't find many myths about but it's also mm. most of the literature so i can share some of the findings which sure. some of the findings yeah. uh, was uh, quite uh, you know uh, consistent with previous research for example mm-hmm. lack of dementia awareness was found uh, so the one of the major finding which came from my research is uh, because we talk a lot about stigma. Mm-hmm. But when I did, it was my study. So I did uh, semester interviews. I did focus groups. And my study involved in London and Portsmouth. So the very surprisingly, compared to my previous research, there was no stigma related to dementia when I, I found that. They didn't say it was stigmatized. The reason I said... I give them example. The previous studies said, okay, my mother is suffering from, my father is suffering from dementia because they, it was, they did something wrong in their previous life. It was the punishment from Allah or God. Mm-hmm. They, they rejected that idea. They said, when the, my, my participant, they said, when someone suffers from dementia, I would say, we would say it's a blessing from God. Okay. Because it's a blessing because you are suffering from this, that if you did some uh, wrong, mistakes it will be for forgiven so hereafter you know life after death it will be easier the allah the god has uh, forgiven you mm-hmm. so that's the one thing and another thing is a uh, family caregiving and obligation is the you know severely you know impacted with, with this community bangladeshi community because most of the caring duties come from the women in the family members yeah. and, the, and the and the male family members they expect it so one of the participants mentioned that as a wife of the house, the female has to look after everything. My son, mm. my father, my parents, even my cats. Wow. Saying this, this is there were so many, so, so, low, so much expectation from the female yeah. family members, which is very difficult. But so another common finding is the various to excesses. But if you, I, I would, I could call it, we could call it as a myth. So one mm. of the myth came from the, uh, my research, I asked them, okay, when you ask for carers, you you ask for same-sex carers, you ask for same uh, Bangladeshi background or Indian background carers. Yeah. So why don't you work as a carer? Then if you it's do not work, then yeah. the caring agency cannot provide. And that, they said uh, that the myth is the thing caring job is for the servant. It's not I for see. the people. Actually, they I've said, heard that before. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. They, said they, 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 they give examples from Bangladesh. They say, you mm. know, if in Bangladesh, housemaids, carers, they work for money and they come to house, they do this. It's not for the family members. So mm. we don't, now we can provide caring, caregiving for family members, not for someone outside the family. And the people will start talking, oh, this person is looking after, you know, cleaning other person for money. So there is a lot of stigma about yeah, caregiving yeah. jobs, yeah. not about the people with dementia, mm. but working as a carer, paid carer, that's the stigma. And they said, caregiver is for the servant, not for us. So that's the one thing I want to know is stigma. And, from, and, I mean, and, the, yeah. and, that, and that is quite like a myth of understanding what yes. is actually that job entails, because if you need it and you want someone and, and you have so much, so many specifications, I want this, I want that. But then when it comes to you yourself, you don't want to do it, for example. And, and that, that is um, 
well, it could be classified as a myth and also a cultural barrier, isn't it? Like culturally barriers and, and lack of awareness and, and so on. So, yes. yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, yeah. A- anything else? For, uh, so, that, yeah, that so as we, um, share, some yeah? of the, so the myths actually, uh, pre- previous research they found that is a, is a result of karma. You know, karma mm. scenes, what yeah. you did yeah. in the past life. But, you know, uh, the, most of the, they talk about realities. Mm-hmm. They, they give examples from uh, the Holy Book Quran. Yeah. He said, uh, no matter in what stages my parents are going, I have to look after them. And, and yeah. I've, I've seen, you know, it was amazing, the carers, the sacrifice they made. But the problem, the male carers, the problem they faced, they clearly mentioned to me without hiding anything. Mm-hmm. They said, I stick to my caring rule as a son of my parent. But my, the, there are two male carers mentioned. They are, um, they are almost going to divorce with their wives because of wow. the, because of the family break. Uh, you know the responsibility. The son, because son was putting more care to the parents than the wife. Okay. That's the reason. That's then. Then they sit together. You know, going through talking therapy. They give example from Quran. That look, this is the I have to do. Mm-hmm. I have to do as a son. Otherwise, I will be asked. You know, in the day of judgment. Yeah. Then the then the wives understood. Otherwise, family were going to break down because they are newly married. They expected so many things from husband, but the husband was, you know. And I was really surprised to see that how you know what many sacrifices they made towards the parents. Uh, they are looking after the parents, and it, it was very hard work. But but do you think, you know, again I think we outlined this earlier, but it's it's kind of finding that balance, isn't it, for both the the couple like male or female to say look okay my parents are suffering and therefore if i don't look after them who will right as a son for example like as i said earlier personally speaking i wouldn't want my parents to be looked after by somebody else if i'm there for example yes in in maybe in in certain circumstances if there is a requirement from the expert point of view then of course we'll we'll get that but generally looking after my my personal beliefs are that the two people, the couples that need to find a balance and say, okay, my, you know, this is the best thing. And my parents are old now at the age of 70, 80, they have dementia or they have any other health condition, or even if they're perfectly fine, I have a duty as a son, as a Muslim, as a human being to, to be kind and nice and, and accommodated, uh, accommodating for them. Like I have to be there when they need me. So I can't just leave them. And I think, this applies to both and i think if the best thing would be is if they find a balance where you know okay don't just completely isolate the wife or the husband and also don't just completely isolate the family because uh, that's also important and that's part of Mm. life uh, for example so finding that balance i think would help a lot of people mohammed let me ask you uh, this question Based on your research and your experience dealing with uh, all of this um, dementia and, and so many other health factors and so on, and working in so many different environments as well. Also, y- you came here as an international student. You went through a different phases and stages in your life, and you are now a very successful academic and okay. one of the best that I've known uh, and, and, and work with. What is your message to people who suffers from dementia, mental health, or any other health condition, as well as, let me broaden this question to the currently international students, for example. They're going through some mental health uh, challenges, especially with the new regulations from the government that they can't bring their families or dependents, for example. So also some of the international students they reaching out and saying, okay, what is it after completing the course, for example, finding the job in the UK is difficult. So what, what is your message overall to, to everyone uh, out there who might be suffering or having different challenges? In yes, life? thank you. So, yeah, as you mentioned earlier, that uh, when you had some kind of difficulty, anxiety, what you did, you didn't, uh, you know, took it yourself. Yeah. You talk to others, you talk. So that's the main things, and we call them, talking therapy mm. so when you talk to others in it, it relieves uh, so the message i would like to send the people suffering from dementia or carers or mental health actually that uh, you are not alone yeah. so the millions of people around the world uh, face similar challenges but 
there is a, a strong community of support. If you are in the university, at the university, there are many supports that are available. Yeah. You need to just need to navigate through those supports yeah. and help is out there. And if particularly for people with dementia, actually, uh, or mental health issues or anxiety uh, or carers, that we need to um, uh, understand, we need to believe that uh, that our health condition actually do not define who we are. So yeah. as a person, our value, our strength, um, our resilience, um, it's defined who, uh, how strong we are. So the focus, we need to focus on the things that, you know, we can still do and enjoy. Yeah. So if you think about the people with dementia, yeah. so they might have some kind of difficulties with it. So what do you need to do? We need to be a little bit patient if you're a carer or if you're a family member. What the person is trying to tell you, you need to listen carefully, just taking a little bit of time. Or if that person going to shopping and they have a shopping list and they cannot tell. So... I know everyone is busy. That maybe the shopkeeper need to take a little bit of time, you know, to understand the person. Okay, what he can do. Um, and for students who are going through mental health issues, other issues, you know, need to be think about that. Uh, uh, one of the things we say that is uh, be kind to yourself. Yeah. Yeah, living living with health condition can be difficult, but you need to be patient you know, with yourself. Um, we need to uh, enjoy the small, you know, small victories, celebrate small victories. Also, the another main thing is uh, seek support. Yeah. So what you've seen in our within our ethnic minority community, when you go through some kind of mental health issues or other thing, we do not seek support. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the things we, do, we found in the research. So we need to talk to our doctor any issues. Talk to you know at least someone with a friend or family members yeah. to share. We, we shouldn't hesitate to reach out for help. Yeah. Uh, and also hope, you know, there is always hope. There are many resources available, as it says, and we need to focus on that thing we can control. Yeah, um, yeah many things. So even though, you know, we have a health condition, but people can, people are still living a happy, healthy life, meaningful yeah. life. Absolutely. Yeah. Dr. Mohammed, mm-hmm. thank you so much for your time and providing this much needed insight about dementia and overall health and the challenges, the myths and the realities. And so, yeah, uh, thank you for that. And I wish you all the best with everything that you do. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I'm really glad I was here. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye.